Hi everyone, this is Rich Lemuro and you're listening to Under Oath. This episode we're going to talk to Dean Strang and Jerry Buting, who've both been on the show before, but we'll have them both on the same time to tell us about their new project, which is the Center for Integrity in Forensic Sciences. And anyone who, who practices law understands how important forensic evidence is in not just criminal cases, but in civil cases and really uh, a, a wide variety of uh, cases that come into a courtroom. And one of the problems with the history of forensic evidence is it, it has not been very reliable. Uh, so you think of bite marks and uh, gunshots and um, DNA, rape kits, saliva, that type of stuff. Those are all just items without forensic evidence. It's when forensic evidence makes it someone's saliva or a gunshot that come from came from a specific gun fired by a specific individual or a bite mark which was uh, used to convict someone in a sex assault or a murder case. So uh, it, it's been tremendously important in the history of court cases, forensic evidence, but it has not been very reliable and there hasn't been a great amount of uh, research and authenticity behind the evidence and behind the science that's used to support it. So Dean and Jerry have made it a point to establish the center, uh, and they're going to talk all about their goals to try and build a resource that will help the credibility of forensic science and evidence in the future of the practice of law. So with that being said, uh, please enjoy this episode of Under Oath. Again, we don't have any advertising or any sponsorship. It's just me uh, putting my stuff together and getting it to you, and I hope you enjoy it. But if you can give uh, give it to some of your other friends who you think or family members who you think might enjoy the show, uh, I'd appreciate it. And check us out on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, and I have a YouTube channel now. I try to put all this stuff up on there. Check it out. But most importantly, enjoy the show. And here is Dean Strang and Jerry Buting discussing forensic science and evidence in the courtroom and the great efforts they're putting forth to try and make it a more credible and uh, better system for the future of American justice. Enjoy. Yeah. Sure. All right, great. So um, I have Jerry Buting and Dean Strang on uh, on the phone. I'm calling from the Outer Banks. You guys are at Jerry's office? Yeah, that's right. All right. Well, we're going to talk a little bit today about the Center for Integrity and Forensic Science Sciences, which you've developed in response to um, what I would call years of highly questionable forensic evidence um, affecting cases uh, and putting people, a lot of people, innocent people in jail. And maybe um, we've been too reliant on forensic science in the, in the past that hasn't been reliable. Do you guys agree with that? Yes, very much. I mean, that's... Uh You've explained the genesis of, of the center. Who came, how did you guys develop the concept? Was it um, just you two, or was it in conjunction with guys like Barry Sheck and Innocence Project? Actually, it was in conjunction with, with Keith Findlay, who is the, the founder of the Wisconsin Innocence Project and also the former um, leader of the Innocence Network, which is a um, sort of a conglomeration of all the innocent networks or innocence projects all over the country. And, uh, you know, Keith, this is really the CIF, the Center for Integrity and Forensic Science, which we abbreviate as CIF, uh, was really Keith's brainchild. And, you know, he thought this is something we really could do. Um, and it, 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 there was sort of, largely because there was a vacuum in policy and academics in the courts on, on what to do about these flawed forensic sciences. Uh, there, you know, there was a National Academy of Science report that came out in 2009 called Strengthening Forensic Science in the United States. And um, it did a whole survey of all the various forensic disciplines that from, you know, from DNA to blood spatter to fingerprints and ballistics and um, shaken baby, all these different um, disciplines that all kind of have their own fiefdoms of organizations, and really it found that that all of them were flawed, and almost none of them had been scientifically validated by usual principles of science other than DNA. 
Right. And they they had a lot of recommendations for the organizations of fingerprint people or the organizations of tool mark and ballistics to, you know, kind of a roadmap of what they could do to improve. And then there was largely silence from all of them, with the exception of fingerprints. They've, they've done some work to try and standardize their process a little bit, but, but all the rest really have done nothing. And um, there was a National Forensic Science Commission brought together in during Obama's um, administration that included academics, uh, scientists, lawyers, um, you know, people on all sides, and law enforcement, people on all sides. And it was making progress, but then when uh, President Trump was elected and Jeff Sessions was appointed attorney general, he disbanded it. And, um, and so there's really been this vacuum ever since where uh, people were starting to make progress on how to improve these various disciplines, the reliability of science in the courtroom. But, uh, and so, so Keith said, you know, maybe we could do something. Yeah, he you know he founded the, or co-founded the Wisconsin Project more than 20 years ago now, and and was an appellate public defender before that. He's today a tenured professor at the University of Wisconsin Law School, and it, this has been a longitudinal interest of Keith's, um, just unreliable forensic science. So the idea was his, and um, he enlisted me and Jerry. Uh, you know, we were only too eager to join in on this. We've known him for years. Right. I guess a good place to start because forensic science and forensic evidence is foreign to a lot of people. Um, one thing they got me interested in is I'm handling a shaken baby case. We've, t- we've talked about it pretty extensively, and I can't get into the facts because the rules of professional conduct prohibit it. But what I've learned through my research is that um, the science that's been applied to shaken baby cases is terrifyingly... Um, not authentic, authenticated by any authorities, really. It's just kind of um, people get into court and tell what they think is the cause of a shaken baby death, uh, and there's no real consistency to it, and it and it's as a father something that's pretty terrifying. So that and and what would you guys uh, say about forensic evidence in cases that that kind of raises the same flag for you guys? Well, for for me, it was a shaken baby case that um, was crucial in alerting me to the unreliability of a lot of purportedly expert testimony um, in criminal cases, especially although civil lawyers would see the same problems in uh, you know in many tort cases. We do. Uh, that's that's very true. But, that's very true. To- Herniated, yeah. herniated disc cases, for example. One doctor says one thing, one doctor says another thing. It's incredible how inconsistent they are. Absolutely. And, um, you know, for me, it was a shaken baby case that I had on appeal um, that rested on uh, seven uh, medical doctors the state had called at trial. The defense had called uh, a couple of its own who gave, you know, uh, conflicting opinion testimony, um, but it really turned out that what the state's experts contended back in the mid and late 90s uh, were uh, markers of abusive head trauma that could appear in no other way. And opinions that there could not be a lucid interval after a child had suffered uh, a traumatic uh, brain injury caused by shaking or by impact. Uh, You know, these these opinions were given with great certitude in the mid and late 90s. People went to prison on them, including the young mother I represented, and she eventually was released because medical science had advanced to the point where, you know, more responsible doctors were saying that testimony was just flat-out inaccurate. It has been disproven since then. And, you know, a key component in getting that conviction reversed was one of the pathologists coming in 
and saying, I would not give that testimony again today. Wow. I believe it to be unreliable and wrong and mistaken, and I feel badly about it. <sighs> now, that's a credit. You know, it's a credit uh, to that particular doctor and to the medical profession that you do have doctors now years later renouncing their own testimony and, uh, and, and willing to accept responsibility for having inadvertently misled the jury, um, you wouldn't see that in some of the other purported forensic disciplines. I don't think you'd see a, you know, a tool mark uh, examiner necessarily, you know, admitting uh, that he or she had been wrong. So that's a credit. But in the meantime, that particular client did more than 11 years in prison. Um, or a, a crime she clearly didn't commit. In fact, what may not have been a crime at all. Yeah, and, and one of the things that, um, it, one of the genesis maybe of, of some of the um, rethinking of forensic science that has been used for, for decades in America really came about with the DNA, the development of DNA and then the DNA exonerations, um, where you know, there's been enough exonerations now that they've gone back and studied, you know, what went wrong in those cases. Um, and t about 25% of them had flawed or just flat out faulty forensic evidence that, that contributed to their convictions. And then, um, you know, th this is one of the problems I think we have in the law is that is the science does advance and you know, good scientists, real scientists, will admit that, you know, their a prior theory or opinion of theirs later is proven false, and then they adjust and they move forward. But the law looks backwards all the time. It looks at precedent cases. And if some case, you know, 40 years ago found that bite mark evidence was reliable and um, probative of, of anything, relevant to anything, then... Well, I guess we're going to let it in now, even though the vast majority of scientists today would say that bite mark evidence is completely bogus. Um, the skin is too malleable. You cannot, uh, you know, create the kinds of impressions that can be matched to a suspect's bite marks or a suspect's teeth. Yeah, yeah, and that's, bite mark evidence is a great example of something that's, that's really at the level of a Ouija board. It's, it's so funny you guys um, say that. Plastic, you know, dentition isn't matchable like that. And yet, Jerry's exactly right. Courts look back retrospectively and rely on what past courts have permitted. And then you get this sort of slavish willingness to, you know, to admit the unreliable again. You're also confronting um, sort of a lab coat bias that. that lay jurors understandably tend to have. I mean, we we defer to, to people who are doctors or have advanced education and purported expertise in their area. We defer to lab coats. The problem is any charlatan can put on a lab coat. Right. So I'll tell you, a funny thing about the bite mark comment, um, I, I did a podcast recently with Larry Simpson who uh, prosecuted Ted Bundy and have very heavily forensic um, science relied on case. And one of their big things was the bite mark from Ted Bundy. So the medical examiner took the flesh that had the bite mark on it, put it in formaldehyde to preserve it, and it actually ended up shrinking the flesh, completely destroying the evidence. Um, and then they ended up making a mold of his mouth and matching it to the bite marks. But in, in his opinion, that was the most damning evidence that they had. And here, here we are one podcast later saying that um, that's very highly suspect, that evidence. It's it, highly suspect is about the nicest <laughs> thing you can say about bite mark evidence. Right. And, um, you know, now you, you've seen DNA exonerations on cases that rested on, uh, you know, forensic odontology and, and purported bite mark um, comparison and you know one of the reasons you you seek DNA exonerations in those cases is that if it is a bite mark 
uh, there's there's a good chance that saliva will carry sloughed off uh, nucleated cells, and that you may be able to do DNA analysis if if that skin was tested and swapped and those were preserved. You may be able to do DNA analysis that will give you a reliable purchase on who did or didn't leave that bite mark rather than, uh, you know, just the, the wholly subjective field of bite mark comparison. Yeah, foren forensic evidence really, I mean, it involves several different types of um, evidence that's used in court. One is that we talked about shaken baby where doctors are looking at injuries and really making conclusions that, you know, did a crime occur or not? Um, was this an accidental death or was this something deliberate? In, in essence, that's what their opinions amount to. But a lot of it, in fact, probably more of it involves pattern matching um, forensics. So whether it's hair comparison or bite marks or does this, you know, ballistics tool marks, does this bullet come match that gun? Um, all of these, the idea, and DNA is, of course, included in there, is where, whether you can match an evidence sample found at the crime scene or on the body with the suspect's um, sample or his hair or his bite mark or his DNA. And that's really where the National Academy of Science report and later the President's Council on, uh, of Advisors on Science and Technology found um, no scientific validity in almost all of those because there's no database. You know, we don't know how often um, people have a particular type of hair, um, you know, what it, what it comes down to, hair comparison, let's talk for a second about that because that's, that there's been some in interesting developments there. Um, the idea of hair con microscopic hair comparison is you find a hair at the crime scene or the body and then you pluck a hair from the defendant, look at it under a double field microscope, and then some, some analyst comes into court and says that it's, they're supposed to say no more than it's consistent with the crime scene hair or it's similar to, but all too often that gets distorted into a declaration that these two hairs match. And it's been one of the most flawed sciences. I've had cases myself where they use that kind of evidence at trial. Later, when DNA developed the ability to actually test the DNA on the hairs, they proved it was completely wrong, just completely wrong. And so the, the FBI, a few years ago, went back and looked at, I think it was like 268 of their cases where their analysts testified in court on microscopic hair comparison. And shockingly, they concluded that 95% of the time, their experts either falsely or exaggeratingly, misleadingly presented conclusions that they should not have. 95% of the time. Um, 32 of those cases were death penalty cases. Wow. Four, 14 of the defendants were dead. Nine of them by execution, the others um, by natural causes. And so the FBI, to their credit, decided that this was compelling enough that we were no longer we no longer are going to do microscopic hair comparison testimony. And they sent notices out to all of the 50 states because. Keep in mind, 90% of criminal prosecutions in this country happen at the state level, not the federal level. And the vast majority of those don't involve the FBI. They instead involve crime lab analysts who are tested by the FBI, I'm sorry, trained by the FBI in these techniques. And so when the FBI suggested to them that, you know, our training in a, was wrong and we need to take another look at this, and by the way, oh, by the way, there's federal money we can give you to help, um, I think all but two of the states said, "Nah, never mind. We don't. We don't want to do that and look at go back and look at our old cases." So, you know, even though the FBI re refuses to do that kind of testing anymore, that kind of evidence, um, it is still being used in other parts of the country. And what about you guys? For so, the the backbone you want to provide for forensic science. Um, it had government funding. It was. It was looked like it was going in a good direction. That was pulled. Um, how do you pick up? How do you pick it up to, to provide that type of backbone that you want? The states aren't going to give you their money. Sounds like the federal government's not going to give them your money. 
their money, what are well, you going to do? SIPS, SIPS has a number of objectives, and in, in, in sequential order, where we're starting um, is in law schools and at universities. And for the first time ever, um, we're going to be pairing natural science graduate students with law students in classrooms and then in a clinical experience. That's rolling out this fall at the University of Wisconsin Law School, uh, but with a curriculum that's exportable anywhere to any law school that's, you know, part of the university that has a natural sciences, has natural sciences programs. So build the backbone uh, in the schools and then that data I'm, can be used. Well, what, what we're going to do is is sit graduate science students down in a classroom with law students and introduce the law students to scientific method, to basic statistics, uh, you know, and to the range of forensic disciplines, which which will also introduce science students to these forensic disciplines, which will look very different to them than chemistry or biochemistry or biology or, you know, whatever their uh, field may be, genetics, so forth. Um, and so the, the science students will learn something about the legal system, uh, its rules of admissibility, finality rules, um, qualification of experts. The law students will learn something about scientific method and probabilities, uh, you know, a proper use of statistics for the first semester and then the second semester, they'll actually work on cases. Uh, together, either at the trial or appellate or post-conviction stage. Um, we're also trying to give amicus support to lawyers uh, across the country, federal or state court, primarily on appeal, but we're also open to our criteria allow us to get involved pre-trial uh, or in, in the trial court um, before a case has gone to trial where uh, the state's relying on particularly problematic evidence. Beyond that, in the longer term, the structural goals we have in mind are, uh, you know, working toward independence of crime laboratories, getting them out from under the control of police departments or attorney general's offices, out from under prosecutorial control, uh, improving their objectivity, and the independence of their funding streams, and then also their transparency. I mean, we really want, uh, you know, to to help encourage forensic crime laboratories to adopt science principles, scientific transparency, and in, in effect, in the end, we hope to make the adjective forensic irrelevant and to put the focus on, on the noun the science uh, that we're able to offer in courtrooms. Let me go back to the to the law school and graduate students portion of it for a second. The genesis of that idea is that um, most lawyers, practicing lawyers and judges are frankly not very well versed in science. And um, you know the, the way science and expert testimony gets introduced in courtrooms, it's, it's basically, you know, the illiterate leading the illiterate. And when you think about law school, uh, every law school for decades has had evidence courses where you learn the rules of evidence, but almost none of them include any kind of specialized teaching about forensic evidence, which is extremely important types of evidence and when it's relevant and how it should and shouldn't be used. And, and so the idea is we need to start young with new people um, coming out of law school, new graduate scientists who are going into forensic science themselves, um, applying real scientific method. And that includes, uh, there's really no other science where testing is done that's not blind. You know, you, but in forensic science, it's not blind testing. In other words, in a, even in a DNA case, they know when they're testing a sample that this is the suspect, that the police believe did it. Um, and they know that this sample is 
uh, an, an elimination sample, maybe just a family member that they don't think is involved at all. There's really no reason at all why a crime lab analyst needs to know that. Um, real scientists would be testing blind samples, and they would say, here's the profile. You know, this is it. Um, and what that lack of blind testing does to crime labs, and one of the reasons we want them to be, be more independent and scientific and transparent, is that there's a human element of uh, cognitive bias, it's called, or tunnel vision. And it's, you know, you can train yourself to be aware of it, but it it's applies to all of us. And there's a tendency to see and reach conclusions based upon theories that you have already um, and, and ignore evidence that points in a different direction. And if, if the samples are blind and you don't know who's the suspect and who's not, then you can eliminate that risk. Um, and that's one of the things that, that unfortunately, when crime labs are, are now are organized under the auspices of, of justice departments or police law enforcement agencies, they've been very resistant to that because they want to be able to, um, they say they want to be able to communicate and let them, you know, they really treat them as if they're their experts, but then when they come to court, they pretend that they're more objective than they really are. That's a, that was a great explanation of the mission, and what I see as you know as a practicing lawyer, um, Innocence Project has has um, developed into a really reliable authority. And when your Innocence Project enters into a case, uh, the, the court takes it very seriously, the lawyers take it very seriously, and I'm looking forward to the day that that will be the same for SIFs, um, and you know not just providing a backbone for data research and education, but also maybe joining in on cases as amicus and co-counsel. Uh, I think that's a great idea and great mission to have. So it seems like that's that's what you guys are looking to do. Yeah, and, and while we expect to and, and do have, you know, budding partnerships with Innocence Projects, Jerry and I want to be very clear that um, SIF is not interested in defense or prosecution. It's, and it's not interested in uh, even in, in rectifying, you know, wrongful convictions of the innocent. What we're interested in is reliability, mm-hmm. and and you know, avoiding the wrongful conviction in the in the first instance by objective, reliable uh, forensic evidence. So this really is not a defense project. It's not a prosecution project, and and it is a project very much oriented toward truth-seeking and reliability of forensic evidence. And I, you know, I, I think too over time that we'll have partnerships with forward-thinking law enforcement agencies, prosecutors' offices that are just as strong as partnerships with, you know, those um, in the innocence projects. Yeah, I hope right. so. That, it's, that's great. It's, yeah. The goal, the goal, really, the, of of good, reliable science in the courtroom is to to make sure that you convict the guilty but acquit the innocent. And you know, we're going to go wherever the science leads us in these case, in this process. And one of the things that we also um, we've partnered with the Wisconsin Institute of so Discovery, um, and um, one of the things we're trying to do is roll out a curriculum that can also be exported all over the country where undergraduate students can actually be doing uh, validation tests on all of these various disciplines to see is, you know, are these theories that have been presented in court without any kind of database or scientific validity in the past, are they, are they reliable or not? And building that through you know, undergraduate students doing these tests, doing um, for credit um, without requiring a lot of federal money or state money, and that's one of the things that's that's we've decided when it comes to the structure of this organization is too much of the decision about what science and what's not and it has become political, uh, politicized, and uh, when funding comes from government entities, they they too often control the outcome, rather than let science go where it needs to go. So we really are dependent on private funding um, of individuals or foundations who care about real science and real justice in the courtroom. So 
Rich, one of the one of the really you know long term opportunities for further partnerships is with um, the civil bar. Um, you know, where I mentioned before, you run into the same problems with unreliable forensic evidence in civil cases. No question. And you you see a replication in some ways of the phenomenon Jerry just described with government funding leading to a government bias. And, you know, in, in civil work, let's, let's take mass torts, you know, or a toxic tort. Um, you'll have epidemiologists who are funded by the insurance industry. You may have other epidemiologists who are more aligned with the plaintiff's bar and plaintiff's organizations or uh, engineering, you know, where structural failures are at issue in a in a product's liability case, you'll have people allied with industry and funded largely by industry or by insurance interests and the same on the plaintiff side. And, and we really do think ultimately none of that serves justice very consistently and very reliably. Um, and that there's a, there's a great deal of progress that can be made in bringing objectivity uh, and transparency to forensic evidence in civil cases as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I, I remember when I was clerking, there was a mass tort case concerning an acne medicine, and um, people's insides were getting basically eaten up by the medication. Uh, there was an enormous verdict for a, a, a girl who just who was, really had no quality of life after taking the medication, and then the insurance company just kind of came back with expert over expert over expert over expert, and uh, that case ended up failing. Um, and I think it was the same type of thing. At the end of the day, I said, I, I'm not sure I believe anybody in this courtroom, but um, it, it certainly seemed like there was no reliable standard. And, it, and this was a woman's life in a different way that was that was in um, you know in in the hands of the court. Yeah, that's right. And you know, pharmacological testimony like you're describing um, in civil cases, I I think you're in a better position than I to confirm or, or reject this, but my sense is that in the end, the, the party or the, or the interest with the deeper pockets often uh, appears to present the more compelling uh, expert testimony on its behalf, and that, you know, just the, the, the funding ought not have anything to do with the scientific conclusions in the end. Yeah, yeah and, and one of the problems is, of course, as I mentioned before, is the degree of scientific knowledge or lack of it uh, by judges and lawyers. And, you know, there are other groups that we may be able to partner with. One is the, the National Courts and Science Institute, which is um, made up of um, chief justices and, and uh, appellate judge uh, justices all over the country. Um, and one of its goals is, to, I mean, they recognize that the courts are really finding more and more science coming to them, and they're supposed to be under the Daubert standard that right. the United States Supreme Court set down. Right. The judges are supposed to be the gatekeepers. They're supposed to first, before the jury hears scientific evidence, determine if it's reliable and acceptable and you know, under a number of different um, standards and tests. And um, and so what this other organization is, is doing is, is trying to train judges to be better um scientists and understanding when, you know, let's say someone comes to them with an environmental impact study. Um, some very complex science is used in a lot of these things, molecular, genetic engineering. It's not just patent cases anymore. A lot of this stuff is in civil cases, and it's, um, it's growing in criminal cases. There's now people going around the country that, that think that they can distinguish one garbage bag from another, <laughs> you know? Um, and... There's very little um, uh, control over, you know, one charlatan or another coming into court. And I'll give you one example for people who've watched Making a Murderer. Um, one of the the villains of the the series that people are most concerned about is was a guy named Michael O'Kelly, who in that instance was a um, supposedly a defense employed investigator and, and polygraph examiner who coerced Brendan even worse than the police to try and get him to admit that he was guilty when he wasn't. And, and 
his session is videotaped and shown in the in the, the docu series. Well, now he's going around the country. He's changed his uh, stripes or spots, and is uh, purportedly an expert on cell tower data. Something completely different, uh, without any kind of qualifications, and people are paying him a lot of money to do that. And so you you see that a lot, and um, you know one of the things that we hope is is that. Um, the courts and lawyers can be better educated so this kind of stuff doesn't happen. Yeah, well, most judges... <laughs> this kind of gets to, you know, one of the major structural problems with the legal profession, which is almost funny, but, you know, but there's some truth to what I'm going to say, which is, you know, every judge in America, at least above the justice of the peace level or the municipal court level, is a lawyer. And many of the lawyers in America would have been doctors you know, if, if they'd done what their parents wanted or if they could stand the sight of blood or if they'd done better in organic chemistry. You know, we, we, we are largely a profession of people who washed out of uh, potentially scientific careers uh, or numbers, because or we are scientifically right? illiterate. Right. And that doesn't get better when you get to the bench. So, you know, it's... <laughs> It's a real structural problem in trying to develop uh, more sophistication among judges and lawyers in the kinds of unreliable evidence that they're unknowingly swallowing. Right, and the first time the judge is going to get an education on the medicine, it's going to be from the people who want their version of the story. So. Right, that's exactly right. Let me ask you guys uh, a question that I think will be fun. What case do you think got forensic evidence right, and what case do you think got forensic evidence wrong that you guys have either heard of or, or know or handle yourselves? Did, or did, has well, anybody you know, ever got it right? <laughs> has anyone ever gotten it right? No, no, we sure. No, no, we've sure. Gotten it right. Well, you know, uh, well, let's use something that's that's hot right now, um, which is the new Netflix series about the Central Park Five called When They See Us. Um, this came out last week, and it's getting a lot of um, a lot of buzz and a lot of viewership. It's a, it's a well-known case, Central Park Five. Uh, five young men, young boys, basically, were coerced to confess, then recanted, but nevertheless were convicted. And after, you know, one of them, I think it was 14 years in custody, um, the real rapist of that, Central Park Tower comes forward and confessed. And then when they, there was DNA all along that was not disclosed to the defense until the middle of the trial when nothing could be done about it. And um, it did not match, and the prosecution knew before trial that it did not match any of these five boys. Nevertheless, they were convicted. And when this other guy confessed um, and they got his DNA, lo and behold, it matched. Um, and, you know, ultimately they were uh, released from prison and the city of New York agreed to a $41 million settlement. Um, but there's still resistance among prosecutors. In fact, the prosecutor who was involved in that case thinks, well, it's not that the other five are innocent, it's that there's a sixth rapist, well, of which there was never any evidence. Um, there was never any evidence that more than one person had raped the Central Park jogger. So, um, but so that's an example where where forensic science can help um, identify the real perpetrator in a case. Um, and I've I got cases of my own where I've I've seen just the opposite. What about you, Dean? Yeah, you know, it, unfortunately. The, the DNA cases offer some of the most solid examples of the good use of um, and reliable use of forensic evidence. Now, not all of these, happily, are um, cases of writing a wrongful conviction years after the fact. What, what's less visible to the public are the people who are eliminated as suspects early on by police and by state crime laboratories because DNA clears them. 
And so those people don't get charged. Uh, or if they're charged, the charges are dismissed quickly. Those are the real success stories of forensic evidence, where, where you're able to spare somebody who's innocent, uh, you know, the public ordeal of being accused of a crime and being put to trial at expense and loss of reputation and often loss of employment. Uh, so, you know, those, those are the, the unseen or often unseen success stories. Many of them, not all of them, but many of them uh, involving DNA analysis, which, which really is, when done right, the gold standard of uh, the forensic sciences in America. Um, you know, the examples of uh, forensic evidence gone astray or um, sort of stretching beyond uh, its limits of reliability are too many to count. But you can look in Adnan Syed's case, you can see that. Um, I think in the O.J. Simpson prosecution, you had both the defense and prosecution relying on some questionable expert uh, analysis, and you know, you, you, these unfortunately are are um, cases too numerous to mention. But any time you're looking at ballistics, you know, purported matching of striations on uh, spent projectiles, um, you really should be wondering whether the testimony of consistency or even a match is worth anything more than the subjective opinion of the next person on a bar stool. Uh, when you're looking at uh, other tool mark analysis, when you're looking at uh, tread comparisons um, on you know, shoes or tires, Again, you, you really have to have the same questions because arson. None of, none of the arson. Um, we had an arson case here in Wisconsin not long ago uh, where somebody went to prison for a couple of years, and in the end, this turns out to be an accidental fire altogether. I mean, it, there, there was no guilty party um, up in central Wisconsin. You know, it, any of these disciplines where nobody can tell you what the rate of false positives or false negatives are, um, are, are disciplines we should be either questioning quite skeptically or excluding from courtrooms altogether. Let me just add on <clears throat> a, a word of caution on DNA. DNA is, you know, of the forensic sciences, it would be the gold standard. But ironically, the more it's advanced in science and sensitivity, potentially the less probative of guilt or innocence it might actually be. Why? Because it used to be that it required a, a, a lot of DNA at a crime scene or on a victim's body or something um, in order to obtain a DNA profile, a complete profile. Now, just a few cells can be um, tested and you can find the DNA. And, and what that's brought up is the potential for innocent transfer where, you know, I may shake your hand and you go off and rob a bank and leave a gun behind and my DNA is on that gun. I never touched it. Um, there's a well-known case out of California, San Jose, I think, where a um, sort of a transient alcoholic was charged with the murder of this uh, sort of home invasion, murder of a wealthy individual, and his DNA, this, this transient's DNA, was found under the fingernails of the victim's body. Um, well, he luckily had an alibi because he had been arrested, I'm sorry, not arrested, He had somebody had called him, he had been passed out at, at like a convenience store a couple of hours earlier. Paramedics had come, picked him up, taken him to the drunk tank or the hospital, um, and so how did his DNA end up on underneath the fingernails of this murder victim? Well, it turns out the same paramedics who took him to the, for treatment later went to the murder 
a scene, a crime scene, and one suspicion is that possibly those little finger things they put to check your oxygen level or pulse on, um, might have actually transferred the DNA. So we have to be careful about the use of DNA. Um, it's becoming much, much more advanced. There are now new new tests that can determine um, through probabilistic genotyping, they call it, um, uh, basically decipher mixtures of many people in a DNA sample and say, you know, try and identify each one individually. There's a brand new type of uh, DNA that looks at completely different markers, um, 230 of them instead of 16 or 20. Um, and, and it's just entering the market now. Private companies are developing these. So, um, you know, we do have to be careful and make sure that the people aren't cutting corners uh, to try and get, uh, you know, the latest um, new iPhone onto the market, so to speak, without um, proper testing and validation studies. Well, let me ask you a question on that. If the law looks backwards for guidance and science looks forward to develop, um, how can you ever catch up? Aren't you just running in circles? Well, part of the, yeah, I, that that's exactly right. And part of the problem is getting judges to be less focused on what past courts have done behind a veil of ignorance and more focused on addressing with some understanding and sophistication what they're actually being presented today. What is the scientific validity for this? You know, have there been validation studies? Is this falsifiable? What are the error rates? If we don't know them, why don't we know the error rates? What's the history of the development of whatever, you know, testimony is, is being offered here? And, you know, be less focused on the mistakes or judgments that courts have made in the past and more focused on the actual reliability of what's being tendered today. That's the appropriate gatekeeping function um, that, that since 1993, the United States Supreme Court has said judges ought to be fulfilling. But if, if, if they remain scientifically illiterate, they're not able to perform that gate keeping function. It's a lot easier, you know, to look inside your enclosure and say, well, as Jerry said, 40 years ago, this got in and it's still here. Right. So I'm not going to kick it out of the enclosure. You know, it, that, that's a lot easier than, than to look at what's coming from outside the enclosure and deciding whether to open the gate to let it in and how far. But it's that forward looking, uh, you know, admission through the gate function that courts really are supposed to be fulfilling and at which they are failing. And one of the things that they've got to do is make sure that the the um, information, the, the studies, the validation, the, the proof that's being presented to them is transparent and available uh, for testing or analysis by a defense expert. Um, you know, we, we've seen this in the probabilistic genotyping with one particular company came out of the private sector who developed this process and they said, um, our algorithms are secret. They're trade secrets. We can't turn them over and let anybody else look at them. Basically, just trust us. We've, you know, and you can't allow that to happen. There, there are ways courts can issue protective orders um, that can still allow the other side to look at the, the code that um, underlies these algorithms and to see if they really are valid um, without, you know, violating, without spreading it further and potentially damaging their trade secrets. Um, courts have to be very careful about that and they can't just allow, you know, because there's, there's profit motives in the private sector too when they develop something and Absolutely. it's being developed in order to try and get it in. Um, into criminal cases where law enforcement or crime labs would then purchase their software or their their method. Um, so courts really do need to be much better gatekeepers of that and make sure that there's transparency in the process. Yeah, and in, in a perfect world, I guess, later on down the road, maybe a judge would be able to pull up SIFs and say, what do you guys, what can you tell me about this so I have an independent 
uh, analysis to, to rely on yeah. rather than these guys. Yes, and we that's where we want to get to that point. And one of the reasons we're offering symposia and trying to pull lawyers and judges in is so that we start to get exactly those kinds of calls, um, and we you know we can be a clearinghouse again with no stake in who wins or loses a case, but just that's right in the reliability of forensic evidence that's being considered for admission. Great. Well, I know you guys have a lunch date, and I don't want to interfere with it. Um, you've done a great job explaining um, the work you want to do, and I- I'm certainly going to preach it in New Jersey, so hopefully we can get the word out there and help you guys any way we can. Yeah, and if people want to help, I mean, we, we do depend on private donations. Um, you can find out a lot more about the organization by going to the website, which is sifsjustice.org, um, c-i-f-s-justice.org. And, um, you know, there's a donate button if you want, but there's a whole lot of information about our goals and plans, and um, and there's a pretty good photograph of Jerry Butin on the website, too. For the, for <laughs> worth a visit alone. I don't know about that one, but um, there is also, I don't know when when this will air, but there, there is a symposium that we're doing in Chicago on June 21st um, in conjunction with Northwestern University of the Law School. Uh, it's a full-day program. Um, the agenda is also on the website. It is free. Um, it will include CLE credit for lawyers, and Dean and I and Barry Shack and... Steve Drizzen and Laura Nyrider will all be there, um, along with some some other excellent speakers and scientists, um, talking about where where we are now and where we can go in the future. And 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 also just one other little hook. There's a really very interesting um, private crime lab in Houston that is um, one of the few crime labs in the country that is not funded and organized under law enforcement uh, and they'll be they're, they've been very successful and, and representatives from them will be coming and speaking about how it works down there in Harris County Texas I saw yeah I know the symposiums coming up I know the second half of the day there's there's a portion dedicated to shaking baby cases which I'm devastated to be missing but my sister's getting married so that's that's what it is for me guys <laughs> but, but you'll have the information available to you. We share this and we share it for free, um, which is, you know, why the, the background support from anybody who's interested in reliable evidence in criminal and civil cases is so important. Right. I saw. I think please, I, we, yeah, I saw it on Facebook did. and um, and Twitter, and there you can get you can get access to that information by um, by social media too, right? Yes, that's right. Okay. It's Sith Justice is also on Twitter. Um, and Facebook, and uh, but please, you know, we do need your help, your donations, big and small. Um, it all helps um, us achieve the kind of real reform that we hope to be able to do here. Great. Thanks for fighting the good fight, guys, and enjoy lunch. I wish I could go with you. And Dean, well, you know what? what? One more last thing. It's summer. Everybody needs good summer reading on the beach. What's going on? I know Dean's got a new book. Jerry's got his. Tell us how to read them. <laughs> Well, if legal history is your idea of good beach reading, um, <laughs> we're, we're a fine group, out. a very small, dedicated group. <laughs> <laughs> my second book is just out. It's called Keep the Wretches in Order. It's about America's biggest mass trial and the critical turning point in the development of the modern Justice Department. I think it is a good tale, a um, bunch of individual stories that together make... Um, a fairly remarkable story of mass injustice and um, a, a strain of real judicial corruption that I uncovered in the National Archives. I'm excited to check it out. Jerry, your book is still out there for and available, right? My book, Illusion of Justice, Inside Making a Murderer in America's Broken System, um, it is out there. A lot of people have read it and uh, more need to read it because it's it's got a message of, uh, of you know, the problem not just on a broader context, not just forensic science in the courtroom, but 
Um, and I've got some suggestions as well to how to how to uh, we can all individually take ownership of our justice system and try and reform it and improve it. Great. I've read it. It's awesome. And that is, that is a good beach read. I've actually had people on social media take pictures of themselves <laughs> on the beach reading my book. <laughs> I read it. It wasn't in the beach, but it was great. I enjoyed it very much. So, uh, Well, have a great lunch, guys. Thanks for joining me. And uh, I'll get this up as soon as I can so hopefully we, people can um, hear it before the symposium. Thanks for talking with us. Yes, enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. See you guys. Bye-bye. Bye.